Greetings, Japanese studies nerds, and welcome back to Japanese literature and culture before 1600. I'm your host, your guide, your sensei. Uh, don't please don't call me sensei, <laughs> uh, Nicholas Tyson. Um, so this is week one, part two. Um, I'm sitting down again after taking a little break. I've got my mug of tea, so hopefully my throat won't be quite as hoarse this time. But let's get into it. So the topic for today's discussion, so this is from last time, I've titled, I don't know, I just kind of came up with this title on the fly, Becoming Japanese. So this will cover the three historical periods generally known first as the, the Jomon period, you have that here, the Yaoi period, and the Kofun periods. These are all considered to be sort of more or less prehistorical, or I guess pre-writing, prior to the point where, where our sources are mostly archaeological or come from cultures who are already writing about what we now recognize as the Japanese. Um, after this period, we'll start to see the Japanese writing about themselves, so we'll prefer those sources since this is a Japanese literature class. But this isn't intended to be sort of an in-depth study of all that archaeological stuff. I just want to give us kind of general overview as to like what this, this whole period is all about. I'm going to close some of these tabs so I don't have 9,000 tabs open. Let's close that one too. What is this? Oh, okay, yeah. All right. <laughs> So now the, the first of these, the, the, the largest, as you'll notice right here, so the period is from roughly circa 14,000 BCE to 300 BCE. It's kind of a long time, it's, you know, tens of, ten. let's see, what is that, 12, no, four, like 13, nearly 14,000 years. It's a really long time. Um, and the Jomon period is known for, so this word right here, they're known for these cord, so-called cord-marked designs on pottery shards from this period. Um, the pottery of the Jomon period is really important because it is the primary source for basically everything we, we know about these people. And also because it is arguably the oldest extant um, pottery in the entire world. Now, this isn't to say that pottery originated in Japan. No one thinks, even the Japanese themselves, don't think that, that pottery originated in Japan. It's just these are the oldest existing examples of pottery. And it's known for designs like this. So when, when this is cord marked, it refers to both to these like these striations here and then stuff like this. And then also the fact that you have sort of like a base form and then there are these like what appear to be like cords of clay that are laid over the top. That's why it's called cord marked. It also refers to the way in which they would take um, ropes and other forms of cordage and actually press it into the surface of the clay to create things like that. So that's why it's considered cord marked. Um, the term itself is kind of weird because so it's actually a translation of a term <laughs> coined by this guy, Edward S. Morse, who has you know, a distinctly non-Japanese name because he is not Japanese. And then it was translated back into Japanese as Jomon. As I noted, um, we're talking about some of the oldest pottery in the entire world going as far back as 14, by carbon dating, 14,000 um, BCE. In fact, it's entirely possible that the Jomon what we call the Jomon are actually older than that. It's just the, we, the oldest surviving thing from this culture that we have is, you know, from 14,000 BC is over, you know, 16,000 years old. So that's why that date is used, but it's possible that it's, it's even older. Um, and as I noted, unlikely pottery, pottery was not created in Japan. It was probably um, imported to Japan from the continent over um, land bridges that would have existed prior to, you know, um, massive sea level rise that actually made the Japanese islands into islands rather than just sort of like a weird extension of the East Asian mainland. <clears throat> now these uh, pottery examples are collectively referred to in Japanese as, as dogu. 
And that term, I mean, even though that term refers to basically all pottery of this period, it refers especially, I should just, well, no, I want Amaterasu open. So most people, when they think of Dolgu from the Jomon period or Jomon pottery um, in general, they, they think of things like this. They think of these sort of kind of crazy figures that um, were probably um, fertility fetishes, um, they generally probably had some sort of, I mean, if they weren't specifically for fertility or for um, like crop ritual purpose, they, they generally thought of having some ritual purpose. Um, they weren't merely decorative. And so there are these ornate figure, oh, sorry, an, another usage that I forgot. Um, some archaeologists and historians actually think that they were used um, in a form, what is called sympathetic magic. What is that? Sympathetic magic is this sort of like some magical practices where you create a figure that resembles in some fashion the thing that you want to affect. So usually like in the form of a person and then you use that sort of resemblance in a sympathetic manner to the thing that you want to affect. And so this is similar to things that you guys may be familiar with, like voodoo dolls or what are called poppets. It's sort of magical fetishes that you use to sort of affect particular individuals. Some people think that these dogu, dogu are used for this reason. Um, this particular example that I have here is in Japanese referred to, it's, it's a really great term. So it's um, shokoki. Dogu. So it refers to the, um, the, so this literally, like this is goggles. <laughs> so, the, so they're goggle-eyed dogu. And that refers to the fact that um, the, the eyes on these figures are said to resemble um, Inuit goggles. There are these goggles that um, Inuit use, especially to sort of like block out the sun where it's just like, it's a, it's a piece of leather and then it's got a thin slit in it. So that you see through the slip and then it blocks most of the um, glare. And so that's why they're called that. Um, the Jomon are also known for some of the early, I should close up to it. Actually, I'm going to close, no, I'm going to close that. Some of the earliest settlements in Japan. Now, the Jomon are generally thought of as um, hunter-gatherers, but there are some indications that they practice agriculture, and agriculture generally requires one to be at least kind of sedentary. And so this is a reconstruction from Sanai Maruyama, which is in um, Aomori in Japan, if you know where that is. And here we have sort of a, a crude watchtower structure. Um, we see sort of what, what kind of looks almost like a Viking like longhouse, although this is a thatched roof and almost like thatched like these are just essentially branches that are like lined up right next to each other. You also see something that is very typical of Japanese architecture basically throughout the history of Japanese architecture, which are these raised houses where you see like they're on stilts like this. Um, this is not just typical of Japan. You see this in Southeast Asia as well. It's very typical of like Thai architecture as well. But you see in this period, you're starting to see the, the, the earliest actual like settlements. Um, and in some cases you see as, as you notice from that picture, uh, some of the more basic features of what is considered to be sort of distinctly Japanese architecture, although as I noted, there are similar things that you see in other East Asian countries. Um, once you get into the like, not <laughs> 10, not 10,000 years ago, but you know, closer to the, the modern time, you start to get more and more contact with the Korean peninsula. And so let's go back to this map of Japan. So you notice, Korea. Hey, it's right there. So this is Kyushu down here. This is Korea. So this island right here is technically Japan. This is Tsushima. Although for those of you who know anything about Japanese, Korean, Korean, Korea, Japan relations, um, they're not exactly always on good terms. But this route here from the area around what is now Busan and then Tsushima here and Iki here, and then you have, um, so modern day Fukuoka city, but the bay is important. So Hakata Bay here. So this is a primary like launching point for cross sea traffic between cross sea. That's really a stupid expression. I apologize for that. 
but um, any like ship based commerce between Korea and Japan. And so a lot of the thing, a lot of sort of the cultural and I guess you could say technological elements that influenced Japanese cultures, or at least residents of the Japanese arch- inhabitants of the Japanese archipelago, often comes via Korea, even if it's ultimately Chinese in origin. Um, and so this has a number of important effects. So pottery is now no longer exclusively that like cord marked style that is distinct in Amjomon pottery. Pottery you now start to see pottery that is more like what it could be seen on the continent. Um, you see far improved metallurgy. So um, you start to see iron in particular being used in the archipelago. Um, also the practice of what is called wet rice farming. Now, this is different from paddy farming. Paddy farming is a form of wet rice farming, but um, rice farming becomes much more common in the archipelago, largely through agricultural technology brought to Japan from Korea. And as I noted earlier, and this is you know, letter D here, the Korean kingdoms basically throughout their existence are a primary vector or like a way in which Chinese influence gets into Japan. Japan, or at least the various iterations of Japanese, <laughs> of a Japanese thing, had direct contact with China at times, but most of it sort of goes through Korea. And that's so Korea as a Japanese neighbor is really important in terms of you know Japan in the larger like geopolitical context. So the the Jomon as a distinct ethnic group, um, their population declined. Um, there's a lot of explanations that are given for this, possibly due to food shortages, um, possibly assimilation. Like this is this is an, actually an open question. Um, but what's worth noting, and I kind of touched on this in my previous video, is that the Jomon, so these quote unquote original ethnic inhabitants of the archipelago, are genetically distinct from modern Japanese. Um, one example is the Jomon were um, much hairier. They were much shorter, um, and more s- stooped, and sort of more hunched, like, supposedly, at least according to like skeletal um, and archaeological remains that exist. And they much more closely resembled um, the modern Ainu in that they were like you know much larger, fuller beards, sort of stockier. Um, modern Japanese tend to be more or less like leaner and sort of more live, more like elves now. <laughs> more like elves, less like dwarves, <laughs> to use um, <laughs> the strange Chinese preconception of the Japanese. Which brings us to sort of the, the, the primary period for understanding sort of culturally where the pre-modern and therefore modern Japanese come from. And that's the, the Yaoi period. Now, the, the Yaoi people largely supplanted the Jomon, um, possibly through conquest, possibly through just like, killing them off, and also possibly just through like you know, overwhelming numbers of them. You know, if you have, you know, native inhabitants of a place who number, you know, in the hundreds, and then suddenly you have a bunch of like, you know, colonists and or usurpers who are numbering in you know, the tens of thousands, they're just going to be more of them and they're going to kind of like crowd them out. Uh, the, ter- the period is named for actually a neighborhood in Tokyo where the first major archaeological excavation concerning the period took place. Like yaoi is not a term that, you know, the people themselves used in as much as, you know, like the, the Jomon people did not call themselves Jomon. Um, the Yaoi people did not call themselves Yaoi. These are later terms, later designations that are applied after the fact. Um, the evidence, the archaeological evidence and various other like forms of knowledge that we have of this period suggest that the Yaoi may have been Korean in origin, possibly. But generally speaking, we're talking about sort of an ethnic supplanting that occurs as they moved eastward. So, you know, if you accept this line of argument, if you accept the, the idea that you have sort of like a larger ethnic group coming from roughly this area, so, you know, they would have, this is the easiest crossing from the Korean peninsula to Japan 
It's right here. So you, what, what you essentially do is you stop over in Tsushima and then you stop over in Iki and then you head into Hakata Bay. And we're talking about, you know, this is before like large ocean going vessels. So, you know, the crossing is treacherous at best. And so then you have a people establishing themselves here, you know, what is now Kyushu, you know, and eventually moving, you know, pushing further and further and further east and therefore supplanting all of the um, other ethnic inhabitants of the, of the archipelago. Now, one of the interesting things about the Aoi period, so the, the Jomon didn't really, had an extremely loose social structure, probably matriarchal, probably. We don't actually know a lot about that. Um, but here in the Aoi period, we're talking about a society that is far more stratified and stratified specifically in terms of class. And this is accomplished by, so, so those of you who are budding Marxists will want to know this term. It was known as um, primitive accumulation. It's this idea that sort of you acquire class status first by being the, the individuals in a society who accumulate resources, who accumulate wealth in some form. And the primary form that we're gonna talk about is for grain storage, and then also land ownership. Now grain storage was primarily achieved through buildings like this. So th this is a reconstruction. This is not an actual, like this, this did not survive. This is a reconstruction of what is thought to be a yaoi style building. And this is specifically a, a farmstead. And so you would have these, these buildings that were very clearly raised off the ground where you would use to store grains primarily not just rice, but also millet. Millet is really important throughout Japanese history. Millet is sort of the, the unsung hero of Japanese peasantry. Rice throughout Japanese history primarily functioned as a, um, I mean, people did eat it, but it was also um, a currency. And so if you have the ability to store grain and to accumulate it, so this idea of primitive accumulation, then you have the ability to store up wealth. And so this idea is that, you know, if you're the person in your village or your sort of social zone who like has all of the resources, then people are dependent upon you. If they're dependent upon you, you have a certain degree of control over them. And if you have control over them, then you have a higher status than they do. And so this is the period in which we start to see this sort of clear social stratification based upon sort of like the possession of commodities. And as I noted here, rice remains a primary currency. Um, the, those, those good old Chinese sources also note that the, the people of the, the, the kingdoms of Wu um, had tattoos that supposedly indicated their status. We don't necessarily know what these tattoos are like. It's just something that it's mentioned in Chinese sources. Um, so as a result of the of becoming a primarily agricultural society. So in, with the Jomon, you sort of have a mix of hunter-gatherer and, agri you know, they had some agriculture, some hunter-gatherer, and so there was this sort of like loosey-goosey, more tribal arrangement. Uh, now you start to have a very sedentary society where you have particular families and like interrelated groups of people settling and staying in specific areas. So they're much more sedentary than the, the Jomon. And like I said, that was largely as a result of um, engaging in the use of more intensive agriculture. So here, they're not just using um, wet rice farming, which is sort of the primary means for growing um, rice, but they're also using patties. So th this idea of sort of like flood, like so specific fields that you flood every spring to plant in the early spring harvest and the su summer and fall. And you know, and you do this in cyclical patterns. And in order to do this, you pretty much have to stay in the same area. You have to have sort of the same resources. You have to have the same sort of like infrastructure to do this. And so this creates a more sedentary society. Um, interestingly though, is that as as you have people like clumping up into particular areas, it also created a sort of decentralized set of political arrangements where there's far more emphasis on the local than on sort of the regional and the national. And this is something that kind of plays out in Japanese society throughout its history where there are very clear tensions between sort of like 
those who have local power, local influence, local control, and the attempts of like, you know, emperors and also just, you know, regional governors to try and sort of bring them to heel. But that's, you know, a story that we'll talk about later on. Um, in the Aoi period, um, their culture was very, very heavily influenced by sort of the, the Chinese cultural sphere. And you see that particularly in the production of, and I think it's this tab. Nope, that's, those are the sunken houses. I didn't talk about this. So the creation of these bronze mirrors, this is the back of the mirror. The mirror would have been polished on the other side. And also the creation of bronze bells like this. So now what's, I mean, what's interesting about these is that they're, they're very heavily decorated. The, the style of decoration, like I said, tends to be more like what you would see on the continent in Korea and sort of greater China. Again, I'm going to just talk about it as China. When the specific dynasty is relevant, I'll talk about that, like with the, the Tang dynasty. But for now, we're just, we're just going to use China. What China is is also an open question. Um, I don't want to get into that because I am not a Chinese historian. I'm not even a Japanese historian. I'm just a literary scholar. So this is, that's well beyond my you know, wheelhouse. Well, what's important about these, these bronze items is that they, they have three functions, really or sort of three purposes. And so they're functional, you know, uh, a mirror is a mirror. You can use it to look at yourself and do your hair and your makeup and all that stuff. Um, but a mirror is also a religious like totem. And also by virtue of being a religious artifact, it is also a political artifact because from this period onward, there is going to be this complicated overlay between um, religious functions and political functions because the the emperor as we will see will become to be figured as sort of the primary priest of you know a native Japanese religion and in that capacity then anything he does as a political figure is also something he's doing as a religious figure anything he does as a religious etc 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 so any items that are sort of you but also the items that are used for these religious functions are not special religious items. They are sort of things that you would have, you know, in your day-to-day -day lives. And this is true of the, the bells as well. In fact, the, the bells are a really good um, example of this where actually, you know, the mirror is a better example. So the mirror is a functional item in that it is this thing that, you know, you can, like I said, you could use your makeup and hair, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But also at the same time, the mirror is a very important thing in Japanese mythology. There is a, in the story of um, Amaterasu in the cave, there is this mirror that functions very prominently. There is a mirror that is one of the three um, imperial treasures, supposedly, you know, handed down to the imperial family by the sun goddess herself. Probably wasn't from the sun goddess, let's be real. Um, <clears throat> And so it has this very clear religious function, but also because it's something that was given by, you know, this religious figure, the sun goddess, to an emperor into the, the imperial line, it has a political, so the religious justification is also a political justification. So all those, all three of those things are in play at the same time. So these artifacts that you start to see in the Aoi period take on a kind of almost overdetermined status. Which brings us to... I'm going to use the term Kofun period. There is also this term, the, the Yamato period, although the Yamato period is generally said to be broader than the Kofun period. But I want to talk about the Kofun period specifically because it brings us up into what I think is a really important transformative moment in Japanese history, and I don't want to sort of get past that. So as I've noted several times in the previous video, the Yamato are the clan most closely associated with the Japanese imperial line and also with sort of Japan as a result with Japan itself. Now the term kofun refers to, oops, I, I did my screen share, that was not good. The term kofun refers to these things. So this is a, um, it's a burial mound, actually, that, um, so this one is supposedly the burial mound of the, the Emperor Nintoku, although that's highly disputed. This burial mound is in the city of Sakai in near Osaka. Um, what's interesting about the, these is that they have this sort of like keyhole shape. 
and then this green part is it's all algae because this is a moat <laughs> so so it's 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 green not because of for any good reasons just because there's a massive algae bloom and then you have another you see you have another moat here and then there's also another moat here and so this distinct style of sort of these keyhole shaped burial mounds but then these areas that's you know these mounds that surround them with moats in between those are called kofum which really just means like old tomb old burial place it's not a particularly interesting word in japanese they're mostly associated with this period um also not necessarily associated with the term wait but definitely with the culture of the period are these figures known as haniwa so this is one of the most um, interesting. Some Haniwa are extremely, are pretty basic and kind of goofy looking. I chose this one because it's a warrior. And we all love Japanese warriors. Um, and it gives a lot of nice indications of these, the style of armor that is used in the period. Um, these were probably leather straps that are then sort of sewn together or tied together, a leather helmet with um, like metal fixtures holding in place. So you're talking about mostly leather armor with metal elements, but you have these, these terracotta figures, which are not quite as um, detailed as say like the terracotta figures you see in, you know, Chinese tombs, but definitely a thing that is associated with this period. So you have important figures who are being buried with the like outward signs of their wealth. So you, oftentimes you see them buried with sword, with bronze swords, bronze bells, bronze mirrors, these sort of religious slash political slash functional items. Um, yeah, a very clear sign of someone's wealth. Now this is the era of prob arguably the most advanced civilization and social hierarchy that existed in Japan prior to the introduction of Buddhism. Now the reason why I decided to stop this particular, well, I will stop this video at, or sort of this discussion at 538 CE is because the introduction of two, there are two major things that get introduced in Japan that sort of radically change Japanese culture. One is Buddhism. Two is a sort of Chinese slash, Chinese style slash Confucian um, administration. So, but before this, you have a very, like you see aspects of, you know, Japanese society sort of in their earliest incarnation. But those two things will really change everything. <clears throat> um, as I talked about last time, the, this particular period is often thought of as the one that is, the, or something like this is what the, the Chinese sources have in mind in their discussion of the, the so-called kingdom of Wu, or the, what in Japanese is sometimes called the Yamata Ikoku. Um, so you, we have this mythical figure, Himiko, and like, like, literally, it's not even clear like how this is supposed to be pronounced. Um, is the, the name of a shaman queen who was mentioned, as I noted in my previous video in the Book of Wei. Um, this is probably actually not even a name. It may, it's more likely to be a title, in fact, which if you break it down, so the, the he, so this is sun, me is, um, if you're familiar with Japanese, me is often, um, it's a sort of honorific that is applied I don't know, not even really an honorific, like, um, it's like wool, but it's an older form. And then coal. So you have sort of like, you know, the child of the sun or like daughter of the sun. Um, this may actually just be sort of a designation of a particular like role in Japanese society, um, sort of like a matriarchal figure. Um, and this idea of the sort of like shaman queen or sort of shaman like ruler lingers in the form of the emperor being considered sort of the primary Shinto priest. Like it is the primary religious duty of the emperor to venerate the sun goddess in addition to like being this um, governmental figure. Now the, the Yamato court society, like I said, it was sort of a loose confederation 
of clans. And it's really in this period that we start to see a more patriarchal order developing. Now I say more patriarchal because if you look at sort of the, the earliest extant records of Japanese emperors and empresses, you see a fair, not an even mix, but you know, a, a, a decent mix of you know male and female rulers. But it is in this period where you start to see more clearly like male-centered um, political orientation emerging, particularly around warrior cults. Now the the Yamato clan was just generally the the most powerful of these several clans based in I mean, here we go. So if you see this is in Google Maps. If you see this sort of outline here, that's the, the ancient Yamato province, Yamato no Kuni. Um, so near Nara, I mean, this is modern day Nara Ken. Ah, oops. So you have the city of Nara here, um, the ancient uh, capital of Fujiwara would have been down here. Um, so like this area near Nara, and then you can see Kyoto is up here. So like the sort of the cultural center of Japan also happens to be where this Yamato clan comes from. Um, generally associated with the, the Japanese policy, polity itself, there's a famous battleship called the, the Yamato. Um, and also there's this, this term in Japanese, the, the Yamato Damashi, which literally means sort of like the Japanese sentiment or the Japanese spirit, literally. Um, it's this period where you start to see like clear titles and sort of like aristocratic positions being assigned to prominent figures. And this is sort of a way of cementing relationships between clans. And once a royal line is established, the relationship between those clans and the imperial household and sort of giving them official positions so that they, they feel like they're part of the governing order rather than wanting to oppose it and cause a civil war, which... Japanese clans tended to do. <laughs> now, I want to talk about this concept of matsuri. Now, in modern Japanese, the, the term matsuri is just the word for festival. So, like, if you have a cultural festival at, like, your high school, bunka matsuri, you know, it's just like, hey, let's get together and eat, you know, street food and, like, play games, like, that kind of festival. Like, festival you have anywhere else in the world. Um, but in this early period, the word matsuri refers to a kind of service to the gods. And so it's, again, an example of this overlay between governmental and religious functions. And you see this, this working out even within the Japanese language. So there's this older term for government in Japanese, matsuri goto, and it's usually written with just this character. So, you know, politics, governance, etc. So you have, you know, you can see it literally in the word. It is the thing related to Matsuri, this sort of reverence, this service to the gods. So government is the thing that is the sort of festive service to the gods. Um, related to this is this concept of kami, which is usually written with the, the Chinese character for god or sort of divine thing. Um, kami could be anything, really. They're originally what are called tutelary deities, uh, mostly, mostly worshipped um, by like individual clans and families. And what's really important in Japanese religion of this time, and also just in nativist, like Shinto and other like native religious practices in Japan, are rituals of purification. So cleanliness is considered to be important. Like if you're, if you're clean, you're good. And if you are unclean or if you're polluted in some form, you are bad. You can even see this, how it kind of works out in the modern Japanese language where you have the, um, the word kire. Kire literally means clean, <laughs> but it can also mean pretty. So there's this idea that something that is beautiful is also something that is, that is clean. Um, and that definitely goes all the way back in Japanese society, this relationship between like ritual cleanliness and goodness. Um, and all of this is very indicative of what I'm going to refer to as a sort of pre-Confucian society. 
Now, the reason why it's pre-Confucian, I, I noted how there are two major uh, developments in Japanese history that are extremely important. One is the introduction of Buddhism. The other is the introduction of Japanese sort of, not Japanese, Chinese administration and like governmental techniques, for lack of a better term. But also at the same time, it's Japan at this time is free, not free, but also doesn't have a lot of the sort of Chinese, sort of greater Chinese cultural hangups. So, and also the, the moral prohibitions that are often um, um, identified with Buddhism and sort of like the culture of the, the greater Chinese sphere, they just don't really exist in Japan at this time. So for example, um, male and female prostitution were both pretty common. Um, and not only were they pretty common, they also weren't even regarded as especially sinful. And so this is from your reading for this week. Um, the authors say pr prostitution was an accepted institution. Transshipment points were commonplaces for this traffic in sex. Although common prostitutes frequently found themselves in the profession as the result of their parents' debt, some quote unquote higher class prostitutes applied the trade by choice. They were allowed to own property, even other prostitutes, particularly those who were themselves slaves. Itomi Tonomura, a shout out to Tonomura Sensei, who is um, uh, someone I studied under at University of Michigan. So keep the faith, has quipped that, quote, women could both have and be property. So slavery was also a thing that was practiced in Japan at the time. Um, for those of you who are familiar with um, the, the master himself, Konkutsu, uh, Confucius, uh, you know that uh, slavery is very bad <laughs> in, sort of con in the sort of Confucian conception of the social order. Um, also in this time, premarital sex super common. In fact, marriage itself was kind of a not terribly circumscribed practice. In fact, a marriage in this period was often just like if like you had sex with someone and you kept and you just stayed in their house after having sex with them for a couple of days, you were considered to be married. <laughs> so it's basically like, are you living together and shagging? You're married. You know, there's not this elaborate sense of like getting married or anything like that. Uh, polygamy was practiced by both men and women in this period. Um, also, homosexuality was not only common in this period, it was also considered to be normal. It's considered to be perfectly natural. Um, and this is something that will, it's interesting how this kind of gets written out of Japanese history, just how common homosexuality is, um, particularly like in the like warrior culture of the, the later periods. Yeah, like gay sex, it's fine. It's fine, guys. Um, only considered to be uh, not fine as a result of sort of later moral prohibitions that develop in Japanese society as a result of foreign influence. So to sum up like the, the sort of the cultural attitudes of this period, things that are considered to be good is just whatever is agreeable or pleasing. If something feels good, something looks good, something tastes good, it's good. Um, if something is gross, if it's sort of it's dirty, or if it doesn't taste good, or if it doesn't look good, it's considered to be bad or even evil. Like if you're sort of polluted, you're considered to be evil. So we have a very sort of rudimentary sense of good and bad. It doesn't really follow like more developed, quote unquote, developed um, moral prescriptions. Um, and that's where we're going to leave off for this time, because next week we're going to start to talk about um, the major uh, sociological changes that happened in Japanese society. That's all for now. Um, hopefully you've enjoyed these two videos for this week, and I will see those of you who are in class, or in class, on Zoom class, on Wednesday. All right, bye. As if I could figure out how to stop.